introduce uh, David Whitmore, our next speaker, who comes to us from the Department of Cell and Developmental Biology at University College London, where he just stepped down as department head, a position he held since 2010, um, with a brief interruption as a visiting professor at Oxford University. So David received his PhD in biology from the University of Virginia, where we briefly overlapped before I moved up here to Northeastern University. From there, he obtained postdoctoral training at the Institute of Molecular and Cellular Biology in Strasbourg, France. After a year at the Max Planck Institute for Developmental Biology, he joined University College of London in 2001 and was appointed to professor in 2010. And as I guess a reward, he became department head. <laughs> so uh, David had a fantastic run of publications from his time at Virginia, working on what was at the time a premier system, model system for the cellular analysis of circadian rhythms, uh, the mollusk retina. Not surprisingly, the mollusk retina. But as Joe and others carried the, uh, the field of circadian rhythms forward into uh, molecular genetics, um, David transitioned to working on uh, a genetic model, zebrafish. So, as you all know, zebrafish is also a, a great organism for developmental biology. So David um, went on to make some seminal discoveries about zebrafish circadian rhythms and about the surprisingly direct role of light in regulating cell physiology. Uh, furthermore, he has done the best and most direct analysis of circadian rhythm development in vivo in vertebrates. I have written here, he said with envy. Uh, <laughs> because I was working on, I've been working on, I had, I've had interest in many years in mammalian, uh, development of mammalian circadian rhythms, or just couldn't quite do the same things that David could. So uh, we're we'll lucky to have him here. <laughs> Great, thank you. Thank you, Fred, and thank you, Anne, for the invitation. First of all, I have to apologize a little about my voice. If it, um, if it gives out part way, I will, um, I will mine the data. <laughs> Um, and dance or some, some other way. Um, I added this little bit here at the end, a zebrafish uh, perspective, because I think the last thing I want to try and be thought to be doing is to convince you that, that, that a lot of fish reproduction has a great deal of similarity to mammalia. Right? Female zebrafish produce around two to 400 parasites uh, every other day, and so their ovaries and their reproductive system is, shall we say, geared for mass production um, in a way that perhaps mammals are not. Um, but with that in mind, um, I'm going to go through some of the data we've looked at, looking at early development and the consequences of the crop in, in the embryo in zebrafish as they develop. Just a, a little bit of background, as Joe mentioned in his talk. And the idea is that there are circadian pacemakers distributed throughout the tissues and organs of the body, and this is true in zebrafish as well. Um, the, probably the key difference in fish is that these organs, cells, and tissues are directly responsive. And this data is actually generated using a Perth transgenic fish that uh, produced a number of years ago. And if you basically go and disassemble your four adult fish and culture those luminescent tissues, you can see that they show quite nice circadian oscillations throughout the brain, heart, tail, <coughs> eyes, muscles, everything. But you can read and train those circadian clocks directly in culture simply by altering or reversing the light dots. So light, the light sensitivity plays a big role in regulating the circadian biology and physiology of these animals, perhaps much more so than mammals, although we can debate that. Now, one of the real reasons we started working uh, on zebrafish is we found that it was probably quite a nice niche to look at the developmental aspects of circadian biology. 
because it's very easy, or it should be a relatively easy system to do this, we thought. The nice thing about zebrafish and many fish species is that they mate about 30 minutes after the lines come on. So in London that means you can have time to get a coffee at about 9 o'clock and then by 9.30 the fish have pretty much done their job and you go down and collect your one cell stage embryos. So this is a classical, you know, almost YouTube video of the first 24 hours um, of zebrafish life. And you go through a rapid series of course of cell divisions. As I say, each female produces usually around two to 400 of these each morning. Uh, then you get gastrulation occurring about six to seven hours. And then that ends up at the end of 24 hours with the formation of the somites and the beginning of early neurodifferentiation occurring within that first day. Now, one of the things we've become interested in more recently is actually using fish models to study um, the issue of developmental rate because different fish have quite remarkable dif differences in their developmental rate that occur. So if this was a cave fish, if this was Astyanax, um, basically within 24 hours you would have a free swimming larvae. So the embryo goes all the way through to being a swimming mini adult within a day. If it was a killifish, and we do quite a lot of work now with killifish, that would take around two to three weeks to reach that point. And if you are working with harpagopha, one of the harpagopha species was in Antarctic species of fish, that would take about eight months to reach that point. So you have a wide range of different developmental rates that you can play with and explore. We actually have a cold water, harpagopha of course develop at zero degrees in the Antarctic, and we actually, thankfully due to the British Antarctic Survey have a, uh, a zero degree fish facility in Cambridge which is quite useful for doing that. Right, so this was the first experiment we did looking at clock function in these developing embryos way back 22-3 years ago I think now um, using good old uh, RNAs protection assays and radioactive gels. And I thought the result at that point was reasonably straightforward. So the fish mate here, lay their eggs, and then we put the embryos, the larvae on the light dark cycle, just collect them. And in this case, we're looking at the expression of the per one gene in whole larvae as they develop over the subsequent four days. If you take those embryos and put them in the dark, you don't see, in the latter stages, you don't see any oscillation in that gene. So they need to experience light early on. The first difference you see is the end of the first day on a gel. And so these embryos must be light responsive somewhere during that first 12 hours of development in order to impact that gene expression. What we haven't really nailed down definitively is whether or not that light exposure here is simply entraining the cellular clock within the cells of that embryo or whether in some way it's actually activating or starting an oscillation. And we spent quite a lot of years trying to do imaging in larvae of single cells to try and pin down whether or not we had an asynchronous developing embryo or whether we had an arrhythmic um, non-oscillating embryo. We have still haven't nailed that. There was a group in Shanghai at the minute who are about to publish an imaging paper where they think they've sorted that out. This product here, we believed, our working assumption was that that was maternal, maternally deposited RNA for clock genes into the early oocyte. Because in zebrafish, the mid transition, so when the zygotic genome becomes active, occurs around about six hours, depending on temperature, in the embryo. So we assumed that the clock gene RNA we found in these early embryos was simply a maternal deposition. And we'll come back to that assumption in a minute. Now, as I said, we knew that these 
embryo is very early on the light responsive. We know that somehow they're detecting light it's as soon as they become zygotically, transcriptionally active. And we've, on many occasions, in di different labs and different techniques, have looked at what that light exposure is doing in these early gastrulating uh, embryos. And the light signal is turning on what has become really rather a predictable set of downstream responses in these fish, for as it occurs in the embryo and in satellites. And the, the light stimulus turns on genes that we obviously think are involved in training the circadian pacemaker. So our current view is that light exposure early on is critical for entraining and setting that clock. It's the working hypothesis. They also, that light stimulus also turns on DNA repair mechanisms. In fact, it turns on components of all the different types of DNA repair pathways. So not just the photolyase dependent pathways that you find in lower vertebrates, but also components of all the other pathways, nuclear excision repair and so on, have some elements that are light dependent in their regulation. And the third class of genes we tend to find, as Joe said earlier, tend to be metabolically related factors. So we think light actually is also feeding in to metabolic aspects of regulation in these developing embryos. An interesting aside, this is just the acute induction of 6-4 photolyze, which is a DNA repair enzyme. In most fish species, if you take those fertilized oocytes and you raise them in the dark, the embryos die. That's true for about 90% of commercial fish species. It's not true for zebrafish. It's true for most. And there's an absolute dependency in those fish for them to actually experience light early in order for them to make it through development. And so you tend to find, if you visit peculiar fish farms, we do some odd work with Senegalese sole fish farmers in the south of Spain, that the fish farms raise all of their larvae in constant light. Because if they raise them in the dark, they lose all of their batch. And one of the reasons we think that that occurs, one of the many possible reasons, is that those early embryos are completely unable to repair damaged DNA in these fish species if they don't experience that early light stimulus. They're incredibly sensitive to environmental stresses. Now, we had hints that this little bit of data was not going to be quite so simple, this maternal deposition idea. One of these came from a, an idea we had to, we were trying to optimize and generate cell line models um, that we could use uh, as, a, as a base for doing mutant screens. And I think Nancy, Nancy Hopkins isn't here now, but one of our interests was using retroviral insertion or mutagenesis in a cell line system to try and generate effectively clonal mutant cell lines. And as part of that, we generated quite a large number of haploid cell lines for that study. And the way we do that is simply to squeeze a male, take the sperm, and then UV radiate. And then take the oocytes from a female and then activate those in a parthenogenic type way with those severely DNA damaged sperm. And you generate haploid embryos from that. Now those haploid embryos usually die after about 36 to 48 hours. And they die from a whole series of morphological defects that occur in them. So you can select them quite easily in that population. And then you just generate cell lines from those terminal um, zebrafish embryos. And the cell lines are fine. So you can generate a haploid based a sound line model, which oscillates perfectly fine, and even though it lacks the male component of the, of the germline. And we thought that that would be a useful tool for going ahead and, and, and doing mutant screening in, in a different model system. Actually, we wanted to do that in Fugu, because the ultimate fantasy was to have an intronless um, haploid fish model, which would have been a Fugu 
uh, saline system that was getting a bit too peculiar. So it wasn't too surprising when we went ahead and started looking at oocyte uh, gene expression in some ways um, to see that in fact those oocytes in vitro also showed quite robust period, in this case per three uh, luciferase rhythms. Um, these are eggs from that per three transgenic fish and you simply either collect them uh, in the morning from the female when they're laid or you squeeze, or if you're feeling a little frustrated, you dissect the poor thing um, and take the oocytes out, plate them into 96 well plates, and let them run on the light dark cycle here for four days. And you can see that those oocytes show a transcriptional rhythm in per expression. Now that's a little bit unexpected to me because I don't know a great deal. state, the oocyte timing and the sperm timing in order to fertilize the eggs. You don't get hybrid fish by just pairing them randomly. They won't mate or they produce infertile eggs. So we, one of my poor PhD students is an expert cavefish squeezer and um, in vitro fertilizer. Now this of course is not a normal situation. The female lays the eggs here at a point when the PER1 gene is at a high level, whether purely coincidental or not. And then embryo and then development can normally activate. So they're not normally sitting like this in a dish unfertilized. And in fact, they will normally die if not fertilized relatively quickly. So you have to adjust your culture media conditions to get a number of surviving days out of those oocytes. So what is true, and, and, and Joe mentioned this from some of Mike Manica's data, is that the same biology is occurring in the ovary of that female. So we know that the ovaries are rhythmic and the ovaries are light responsive as well. And so that within the female you see the same phased rhythm in clock genes. Now one of the ideas then is that that clock is generating those oocytes so that they are at an optimal state of maturity to be laid at 9.30 in the morning and therefore fertilized at an optimal time um, from those females. Now if you're a fish and you're an external breeder, um, 
getting that timing is rather critical. Right? So you need the male to be there at the right time of day to do his bit, and you need to make sure that your eggs are at the same level of maturity to be fertilized optimally at exactly that point, about 30 minutes after dawn. So we think the clock is playing a role in regulating the maturation of those oocytes in the ovary so that they are at an optimal state for fertilization at dawn each day. If you take the eggs from the same female and put them into constant darkness, you do see a very noisy, I don't think I've ever seen error bars from any data we've produced, actually quite this, all this large. Uh, there's a trend of a rhythm through there, but without light exposure, you don't see a very good coordinated rhythm. And so we know that these oocytes actually are directly light responsive as well. And so you can do acute light pulses and look at the genes that are induced in them. And it's the similar set. So you're inducing DNA repair genes and genes involved in clock entrainment and some uh, metabolic targets. They do contain um, a wide set of photopigments in these oocytes. They are, they contain possibly some of the relevant opsins that are involved in detecting that light. Now, fish light sensitivity, I decided actually God decided to punish me um, for my sins with this because the first rant I ever wrote was to try and figure out what the circadian photopigment was in these fish. And I was hoping for maybe one or two, uh, this was before melanopsin had been discovered in mammals, one or two opsins. We ended up with 32 non-visual photopigments um, in these fish, which almost drove me to total despair, because at that point, the idea of having to generate 32 mutant uh, fish lines was more than I could stand the thought of. Um, thankfully, in the last few months, actually, the CRISPR efficiency in approaching these fish is now enough that we can do this as an acute experiment. We can now just inject and knock down in those F0s those options. So finally, we can actually start to explore the specific role of some of these wave of 32 options. What is clear, although fish, everybody when I say that, so that's just a weird bit of weird fish biology, having so many photopigments, but actually it tracks phylogenetically through the reptiles and the birds, contain the same number. And it's only when you hit the placental mammals that you see a dramatic drop off in the number of photopigments that are present. But in placental mammals, you're looking at five non-visual photopigments, one of them being, of course, melanopsin, which is perhaps the best explored. And so I still think there's a lot of light biology uh, to be uncovered um, in mammals that hasn't yet really been fully explored. Now, I would say in an oocyte, we're looking at around 9 to 10 opsins that are highly uh, are present at a high level. This is a, an analysis, don't bother trying to read this, this is a developmental analysis of that 32 plus 10 um, opsins that are present in these fish. So that across different developmental cycles. And what one can see is that there's a number of opsins of these novel opsins that are expressed early on. When you hit in the middle of day three, the retina differentiates. And so the eye becomes functional, and then you actually get a wave of classical visual photopigments being expressed. And these opsins turn on as different cell types and different tissues in the embryo begin to differentiate. Each different tissue in the animal has a different opsin composition. Again, this is another horrible heat, heat map, looking at these photopigments in different tissues. Most of them are found in, in the retina. A lot of them are found in brain. Um, the internal organs tend to have fewer. This, so each tissue has a different composition of photopigments. What is slightly odd is that actually each of these different 
tissues also has a different light spectral sensitivity. And that roughly tracks along the lines of ectodermally derived tissues, so brain, skin, and so on, are primarily blue light responsive, whereas endodermal tissues, internal organs, are shifted into the red and are primarily, primarily red sensitive. Now that's more than enough weird fish biology um, you know, for you to digest for a few minutes. So back to, back to something a little more um, rhythmic and embryonic. I, um, when I knew Nancy Hopkins was sitting there, I was actually quite terrified. I used to have, I used to have nightmares about giving this talk, actually. Um, in front of Nancy, because there's a, a slight funny history to this. One of the things that we do a lot of is generate cell lines at different stages of, of um, embryo development. And this actually is the cell line that was first developed in Nancy Hopkins' lab back in the early 90s. This is the PAC uh, cell line that, that came out of MIT. It's named after one of her graduate students. And um, it turns out to be a really superb circadian uh, model cell line system that was produced. We found it, um, if I confess, we found it in a freezer in Tübingen um, many years later and started playing with it. And that cell line, that zebrafish cell line, again shows robust circadian rhythms and is directly light responsive, so you can read and train that circadian clock in culture. Now, we tend to bounce between using the larvae and cell lines that we generate um, from these embryos to test various aspects of the biology. Fundamentally, I believe that these cell lines we generate certainly have stem cell, if they're not definitive stem cells, they have stem cell properties. We can take them, inject them back into the blastula, and those cells reintegrate back into the three different germ lines within that developing embryo. And so you can then track those cells, either with a GFP marker or with luminescence, in those chimeric animals. So they have at least some degree of stem cell uh, potential. So we tend to look at the, what the clock regulates a lot in cell lines, and then we flip back to looking at what's happening in the embryo, or vice versa to compare and work on these things. And one of the slightly odd aspects that we found in these cell lines that, that changes is that they show in culture rhythmic self-communication. So they actually rhythmically form gap junctions and break them. So the cells in the early morning don't communicate with each other very well, and then they literally form more gap junctions uh, in the early night, and then they break those gap junctions again. So there's actually a spontaneous rhythm in cell communication that occurs in that cell culture. And if you knock out the clock gene or overexpress a clock dominant negative, you can obviously abolish that gap junction communication rhythm. And in fact, you actually, most of that gap junction is the connexin 43 in this case does not insert into the membrane, it stays within the cytoplasm of those cells. Um, you see very different cell velocities, cell movement speed in culture. The cells move relatively slowly in the early day, but much faster. They have much higher speed of movement and motility um, in the early evening than they do in the day. And if you play with the system, so if you knock out again, you create a clock mutant. That clock mutant actually accelerates cell motility. The cells move faster in that cell culture. Or if you expose those cells to constant light, which actually also effectively makes them arrhythmic and stops that clock protein working again, you accelerate cell motility. Now we know that one of the paths that that's happening is an input into cadherin level expression. Um, in clock mutant situations, there are small changes in the cadherin, type of cadherins that are expressed. 
if you alter the lighting conditions, you actually get very dramatic changes in cadiran expressions. You get a switch um, with light increasing E-type cadirans and shutting off the N-type cadirans, which we think actually leads in part to their accelerated migration. So one of the things we're trying to do now is actually look at that in migrating neural crest cells in the actual embryo, embryos that are raised on opposite life dark cycles, to see if we can actually see whether or not actual cell migration within the developing embryo has a different day-night rate. A slightly less focused approach was simply to ask the question, what on earth is the clock really regulating in these early developing uh, embryos? And so we did this using a nanostring approach rather than RNA-seq type strategies. And we selected about 9700 genes that were known to be important for various steps of embryo in cell regulation and embryo development. And then we actually looked at those from day four to seven of development. This was quite an interesting scenario because I wanted to actually do day one to four. But the PhD student in my lab, who's an incredibly talented PhD student, refused to do that experiment. Um, which I thought was odd. I'm like, you know, I'm paying the bill, but you won't do it. Um, so he won. <laughs> And we did it the way he wanted, thankfully, as we'll see in a minute, and did day four to seven, and not day one to four. And if you do that and screen through, you find a whole series of clock regulated targets in those developing embryos. A lot of genes involved in cell cycle regulation, and we'll look at those in a minute, but also a lot of genes involved in cell differentiation and the regulation of cell fate. And we'll have a look at a couple of those very briefly in a minute as well. Genes in, in the intestine, differentiation of intestinal cells, and in neural cell types. The one that caught our eye, for those interested in neural differentiation, um, was NeuroD, which is one of the key, transfer, uh, key factors that regulate the, different, the terminal differentiation of neurons in the developing brain. And those show uh, a very strong circadian rhythm in expression, peaking in the late day, during days four to six in this case. Now, Ricardo, thankfully, was right. If I'd have done that experiment, we would have been working down here, and we wouldn't have actually seen any of those rhythms. So I'm kind of glad he was a belligerent. Little shit, really. Um, <laughs> if he was to do it. Um, so what is interesting is that clock regulation of those outputs turns on relatively late. We know the purging and cryogenes are oscillating down here, but the outputs are not activated, in this case, until quite late. The same is true for the cell cycle. So we know that mitosis and S phase timing in the embryo is regulated. We know, in this case with simple BRDE staining, that the wave of DNA replication, I suppose, occurs in the late day. And if you look at the regulators, cell cycle regulators, and their rhythms that we believe are critical for this, in particular, um, cycle independent kinase 1A, in this case P21, you again start to see very robust rhythms in the regulation of P21 expression and the gating of G1 to S, again, really starting around day three to four um, in the developing embryo. So again, later than we were expecting. Flicking that back quickly to our cell line systems, and I still get a kind of a cheap thrill out of this for some reason. Um, because the cell lines are light sensitive and they set the clock in the cell lines, we can synchronize the cell cycle in cell culture simply by changing the illumination in the incubators. So that's, you don't need to use any aphidocholines or any drugs, you just change your timer. And because those two are tightly coupled, you change um, your cell cycle timing. And so you can see actually, this, in this case, this is looking at the per one rhythm in cell culture. And this is the rhythm in P21, 
Um, when P21 levels are high, the sows are held in G1. When it drops to a low level, that gate is released and cells progress into, into S phase. So it happens in cell culture and in the embryo. Now the regulation of the cell cycle, some of these cell cycle events is quite simple um, in terms of clock regulation. You simply have a very simple clustering of E-box elements, in the case of P21, around the transcription start site. And if you mutate those, uh, E-box elements, you abolish that circadian regulation. So it's a very simple direct transcriptional output, as Joe was mentioning earlier. So why the problem we had is why do we I'll be very brief. A lot of the E-box regulated downstream genes don't seem to become clock regulated until for a fish relatively late, day three or four, even though the clock is we think oscillating two to three days earlier from the first stages of development. But what we think is actually happening is the clock itself is actually undergoing a developmental process, is actually maturing developmentally. And we think there's an embryonic circadian pacemaker which actually changes as the tissues differentiate and becomes a kind of a, a fully formed circadian clock. And the reason that Ricardo didn't want to do work early on was he said that actually my own data that I did when I was a postdoc had shown that in fact the clock gene doesn't really itself start to show weak oscillations until around day three to four, even though the per genes are oscillating three days earlier. And so if you're looking at genes that you think might be E-box regulated, you're a bit of an idiot if you do that. Uh, screen early when they're not rhythmic. The same is true of components of that revert pathway. So the revert rhythms also in the developing embryo don't kick in until that day three or four. Even though again the cry per oscillations are going on down here earlier. So what we think is actually happening is that there's an embryonic pacemaker and we don't fully yet know how that is actually working in detail, which actually then undergoes a differentiation in specific tissues. As the embryo of the cells differentiate, and elements of that second or third circadian loop kick in and become part of the oscillator. So DMAL, clock, and the reverb start oscillating from day three or four of development onwards, and the per cry system is oscillating somehow on those first day one, day two, day three of development. So there's a maturation of the clock. And at that I should probably stop also before I lose my, finally lose my voice. So we know that the, uh, to summarize briefly, the oocytes have a clock in them, or at least they have a transcriptional oscillation in them. Whether or not they have a functional clock in them is an issue that needs to be proved. Um, we know that they are directly light sensitive, we know that the ovary has a rhythm, we know the ovary is directly sensitive, and that drives an entrained rhythm in the egg production in these fish. Um, the per oscillations start in the oocyte, and then run through, all the way through development from then on. However, other components of the clock don't start being rhythmic until later, until like three or four days later, you don't have a fully mature clock until later in development. And at that point, when you have a fully mature circadian oscillator, that grabs control of your rhythmic outputs. And then that drives aspects of cell motility and cell cycle and cell differentiation in those later embryonic stages. So, a little bit, five minutes, a little too long. Um, but I'd like to thank Ricardo for being a complete pain in my ass. He's now actually um, a very successful postdoc up at Rutgers. Kathy Tamai, who did a lot of this work along with Inga and, and Pete Cormie. So thank you very much. Do you get a rhythm if you do that? We haven't done that yet. 
the day during the week. <laughs> <laughs> I remember this issue being controversial back yes. in the days when Bernard and Christine Teese mm -hmm. tried to show this, and there was a bunch of controversy about what was going on. I was just yes. interested to see the latest. That one I need a stiff drink before yeah. we talk about that. <laughs> I thought this was going to be a very easy and simple story, and the literature on this is a profound mess. Um, but that would be unprofessional of me to tell the truth. Um, <laughs> All right, so now, Jeff, you're going to talk about Is it also from Jose? Yes. Um, it is. Uh, can you ask Dr. Whitmore what type of culture system he uses to cultivate the zebrafish cells? Perhaps he could reference the original work where the condi uh, conditions were published. And second question, is there a specific amount of light necessary for females to produce eggs that fertilize properly? Thank you. <laughs> Jose is working on his tanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the culture system um, is very simple. We actually do use the initial one that was published in Nancy Hopkins' paper back in 92. It's a very simple L15 media, fetal calf serum, and antibiotic. That's it. It's, it's nothing too complicated about it. To keep the oocytes alive for a longer time, we tend to increase the serum level a bit by a few percent. But I think that's a detail. Yes, the whole system has an intensity light response characteristic to it. Um, and it integrates, seems to be integrating intensity and duration. So you can get away with a shorter light pulse if that intensity goes up. Um, roughly, we tend to work with light intensities, probably about the equivalent of this room, usually around 200. Most of our experiments are done at about 200 microwatts per centimeter squared. But we do have data where we've gone through the intensity response curves. Um, and it can work quite dim light intensities if the duration of the light pulse is lengthened. So it's integrated.